Hello guys, this is Dr. Sriteja. Today I am very much happy to inform you that we will be starting a series of lectures in physiology. Now in this series of lectures, we will be covering all the important topics which are necessary for your undergraduate level as well as for the competitive exams. Now today, let's start with the series of lectures in renal physiology. Guys, now in this class, we will be mainly discussing about the basics of renal physiology. In the later upcoming videos, we will be mainly concentrating on more conceptual topics. Having said that, let us begin with the topic of introduction to renal physiology. We all know that we have two kidneys. Now what is the function of kidneys? Usually students will say excretion is the function of kidneys. But not only excretion, there are other certain functions also. So, let us write it down here. What are the functions of the kidneys? Functions of kidneys. So, what are the major functions of the kidney? The first function is, yes, excretion. Excretion of nitrogenous waste products. Now, what are the waste products which are produced because of metabolism? See, every day, there is production of urea and creatinine. Okay. So, urea and creatinine are produced inside the body. These are not good substances. So, these substances need to be eliminated from the body. So, kidneys are going to take a role of eliminating these substances. That is what the major role every student knows this. Apart from excretion of the nitrogenous waste products, now kidneys will also help in production of something called as erythropoietin, EPO4, erythropoietin. Now, what exactly is this erythropoietin? Erythropoietin helps in production of RBCs. Okay, if you have any doubts, you can all the time comment on the comment box. Okay, comment session, I can uh, reply you. Okay, so don't feel hesitated. If you have any doubts, you can all the time put your question in the co comment box. Now, erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is produced by the kidneys. Now, if you ask me in specific, so in the kidneys, erythropoietin is produced by which cells? Erythropoietin is produced by the peritubular capillaries. Okay. So, there are certain blood vessels called as peritubular capillaries. Now, if you ask me what exactly are these peritubular capillaries, remember guys, now I am just showing you a simple nephron diagram. Okay. See, this is a nephron with proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, descending convoluted tubule, digital convoluted tubule and collecting ducts. Now, the nephron is surrounded by blood vessels. We all know. Now, these blood vessels which are surrounding the nephron, now those blood vessels are called as peritubular capillaries. Yes, now these peritubular capillaries are the ones who produce erythropoietin. So, erythropoietin is produced by the kidneys. Everyone knows. But which cells? Peritubular capillaries are the peritubular capillaries are the blood vessels which are helping in the production of erythropoietin. Erythropoietin helps in production of RBCs. Second function is completed. The third function of kidneys is renin. Okay, renin secretion. Okay. Now, renin 
helps in increasing the BP or helps in maintenance of BP. Now this renin is produced by the kidneys. Which cells in the kidneys or which cells in nephrons are producing this renin? Renin secretion is under the control of JG cells. Now JG cells are also called as juxta glomerular cells. Now juxta glomerular cells are the ones which actually produce renin. Now what is the function of renin? Renin maintains the blood pressure. How it will maintain the blood pressure? We will see in a moment. But first let us complete all the other functions. Now the fourth function of the kidney is activation. Activation of vitamin D. Okay. Normally vitamin D is something which is produced in the actual the production, the precursors of the vitamin D are produced in the skin. But the activation of vitamin D ultimately happens in kidney. Now in kidney which cells sir? What is the area where vitamin D activation is happening? Vitamin D activation happens in the PCT that is proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, so proximal convoluted tubular cells. We all know, right, after the Bowman's capsule, there is a something region called as proximal convoluted tubule. After that, there is a descending limb of loop of Henle, ascending limb of loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and collecting ducts are there, right? So that proximal convoluted tubule, the first part of nephron. So proximal convoluted tubule is the area where vitamin D activation will happen. Okay, how that will happen, sir? We'll see. Renin pathway that is RAS pathway, renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway and vitamin D activation we will see in just a few minutes. But activation of vitamin D is happening in the PCT cells and the last function important function is acid base balance. Okay, acid base balance. Acids are the protons, bases are the major bases bicarbonates. See, all the time we need to have a proper pH. The normal pH in the body is somewhere around 7.35 to 7.45. That is the range. Okay, normal range. And it needs to be all the time maintained. For example, if there is any changes in the pH, something like low pH which is causing acidosis in the body or high pH which is causing alkalosis in the body, both of them are dangerous conditions. Now in both the conditions, whenever there is change in the pH, proteins will be denatured. Okay, so cells will affect, cells will be affected or the cellular function will be affected if there is any changes in the pH. So all the time, your and my pH need to be maintained at, at 7.35 to 7.45. That, at that level, it need to be maintained. So who is taking care of maintaining the pH? There are many levels, something like, see there are buffers in your blood which are maintaining the pH. Even lungs can maintain your pH and also remember, Kidneys are also having a role by which they can maintain the pH. Okay. So, kidneys can also maintain your acid-base balance. Okay. There are also other, other systems like buffers, lungs, kidneys, GIT. They can also maintain the pH. But as our topic is right now kidneys, kidneys can also maintain the pH. That we will discuss in the later topics. So, these are the functions of the kidneys. Just try to recap what are the functions of the kidneys, guys. First one, excretion of nitrogenous waste products. Second one, production of renin. Third function, production of erythropoietin. Fourth function, activation of vitamin D. And fifth function, maintenance of acid-base balance. Okay. Now, having said that, now let's talk about activation of vitamin D. Activation of vitamin D. See, someone is asking, uh, will the video be saved, Ashish? Yes, the video will be saved in the YouTube. You can watch it again and again also. Okay. You just ask me if you have any doubts. Okay. This is a live interactive class. This is not a recorded class. You can ask me any questions. Like, you know, activation of vitamin D. Okay. Yeah, uh, someone is asking Muller, you are asking me about the acidification or like alkalosis. Yes, we will discuss. See, whenever your blood pH, if it is coming to 6, 5, that condition is called as acidosis. Or whenever your blood pH is increasing, 
or it, if it becomes 8, 9, that is called as alkalosis. So, both this acidosis and alkalosis will be discussed in the subsequent videos. This is not a proper time to discuss about acidosis or alkalosis because this is all about the introduction. Okay, this is an introductory video. In detail about acidosis and alkalosis, we will discuss later. Okay. Now, first let us talk about activation of vitamin D. Now, for this, we have to start our story from the level of skin. Okay, this is your beautiful skin which I am showing you here. Of course, your skin is not red. Let me show you here in the form of red. Now, in your skin or under your skin, do you have subcutaneous tissue or not? Yes, subcutaneous tissue or subcutaneous fat is there, right? Now, there, ha there is something called as 7, uh, not 7, there is cholesterol. So, less cholesterol is there. Okay, let me write it a correct spelling. Okay, so under your skin, there is cholesterol. So, in the morning, morning, whenever you go into the sun, okay, here I am showing you sun. Now, from the sun, who is coming? There is U, V, B, okay, UV light, okay, UVB radiation is coming. Now, this UVB rays, they will come and touch your skin or not? Yes, they will come and touch your skin. Now, in the presence of sun, what will happen? This UVB radiation, it's a form of energy, right? Now, this energy will convert the cholesterol, whatever is there under your skin, into something called as 7 D hydroxy cholesterol. Okay, so the cholesterol under your skin will be converted into 7 D hydroxy cholesterol. Now, that is the reason why. They say, usually people say, you will get vitamin D from the sun. So, what exactly sun is doing? Sun is producing this UVB radiation. With the help of this UVB radiation, cholesterol will be converted into 7-dehydroxy cholesterol, which will be acting as a precursor for vitamin D. Now, this 7-dehydroxy uh, cholesterol, it will ultimately be converted into vitamin D. Let us see one by one how it will happen. Now, 7, this 7-dehydroxy seven, uh, cholesterol, okay. Now, it will convert into, okay, it will convert into a substance called as cholecalciferol, cholecalciferol, which is also called as CCF. This also happens because of that UVB radiation, okay, UVB radiation will also convert this 7 dehydroxy cholesterol into cholecalciferol, okay, it also needs what? UVB radiation. Now, this cholecalciferol, where it will go? It will go into your beautiful liver. Okay. In the liver, the CCF, cholecalciferol, it is getting converted into something called as 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol. It is the same, cholecalciferol. But what is happening? On the 25th carbon position, hydroxylation is happening. So, the cholecalciferol which entered into the lung, so not lung, which entered into the liver, it got hydroxylated. Hydroxy group is added on the 25th carbon position. So, it became 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol. Now, the question is, first hydroxylation in the process of vitamin D activation happens in which organ? First hydroxylation in the process of vitamin D activation is happening in the liver. Okay, so first hydroxylation is happening on which carbon position? 25th carbon position. Now, what happened to this 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol? This 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol, now it will go to your kidneys. Okay, our topic kidneys. Now, in the kidneys, this 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol, it will go to PCT, proximal convoluted tubular cells. Now, what is happening? This 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol, it will be converted into 1 comma 2 5 dihydroxy, okay, dihydroxy cholecalciferol, okay. In the PCT, this 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol is converted into 1 comma 2 5 dihydroxy cholecalciferol, okay. In the PCT, with the help of which enzyme? With the help of alpha 1 hydroxy. Lays, OH means hydroxy. So, with the help of alpha 1 hydroxylase in the PCT cells, the 25 hydroxy cholecalciferol, which is inactive vitamin D, this is inactive. This is inactive vitamin D will be converted into active 
विटामिन डी नाउ आंसर माई क्वेश्चन वॉट इज द एक्टिव फॉर्म ऑफ विटामिन डी द एक्टिव फॉर्म ऑफ विटामिन डी इज सर दट इज वन कामा टू फाइव डाई हाइड्रोक्सी कोरिक एल्सी फॉर ऑल ना वॉट एक्सैक्टली इज हैपनिंग इन द पीसीटी ऑफ द नेफ्रॉन्स सर इन द पीसीटी ऑफ द नेफ्रॉन्स विद द हेल्प ऑफ एंजाइम आल्फा वन हाइड्रोक्सिलेज there is second hydroxylation is happening see previously there is only hydroxylation on one previously there is uh, hydroxylation only on the 25th carbon site now in the pct hydroxylation is also going to happen on first carbon position that's why we are calling it as 1 comma 25 dihydroxy so two hydroxylations are happening and the two hydroxylations are happening on the carbon number 1 that that's the reason why 1 and 25th carbon so 1 comma 25 dihydroxy colecalciferol which is nothing but active form of vitamin d now this active form of vitamin d there is one more name what is the other name for this active form of vitamin d it is called as calcitriol calcitriol don't say calcitonin calcitonin is absolutely different active form of vitamin d is also called as calcitriol now what is the function of vitamin d just tell me you just try to answer guys what is the active form of vitamin d what is the function of active form of vitamin d i am asking you anyone it helps in it helps in yes calcium absorption calcium absorption as well as phosphate up absorption okay so helps in both calcium as well as phosphate absorption so this vitamin d it's getting activated in the kidney it will go to your gat it will go to your gat mucosa in the gat mucosa it helps in calcium as well as phosphate absorption so remember for your entire life vitamin d helps in absorption of both calcium as well as phosphates okay so calcitriol increases calcium and phosphate absorption now i am just want you to know i just want you to know what is calcitonin calcitriol it is getting activated in the kidney no doubt now my question is from where this calcitonin is coming and what is the function of calcitonin the calcitonin it is coming from thyroid gland thyroid gland now you will get it out sir thyroid gland is helping in the production of thyroid hormones t3 and t4 but remember in the thyroid gland let me show you in the thyroid gland there are two types of cells there are cells called as follicular cells and there are also cells called as para follicular cells now follicular cells are the ones which are helping in the production of t3 and t4 that is the thyroid hormones para follicular cells are the ones which are helping in the production of calcitonin calcitonin now tell me calcitonin is produced by which gland thyroid gland what are the cells helps in production of calcitonin para follicular cells now what is the function of calcitonin calcitonin decreases the blood calcium level calcitonin is exactly working opposite to vitamin d so write it down here guys calcitonin decreases the blood calcium levels calcitriol vitamin d increases the blood calcium levels now here i just want to uh, i just want you to know a few more important points regarding the calcium homeostasis okay see i just want you to answer i want you to answer what is the other hormone involved in increasing the blood levels of calcium vitamin d increases the blood calcium blood levels of calcium no doubt but there is one more hormone which is present in your body which increases the blood calcium levels can you tell me what is that hormone which increases the blood calcium levels excellent excellent para thyroid hormone excellent isha it's the para thyroid hormone from the which glands para thyroid glands para thyroid glands are there right see in the para thyroid glands okay back to your thyroid gland back to the thyroid gland there are four para thyroid glands and what are the cells present in para thyroid glands the cells in the para thyroid glands are called as chief cells okay chief cells now this para thyroid hormone uh, the uh, the chief cells of para thyroid glands they are the ones producing the para thyroid hormone para thyroid hormone also increases the blood levels of calcium so at the end of the day what i want you to know is sir vitamin d3 Okay, let me write it down here. 
विटामिन डी थ्री दट इज एक्टिव फॉर्म ऑफ विटामिन डी विटामिन डी थ्री इंक्रीजेस ब्लड कैल्शियम लेवल्स पैराथाइराइड हार्मोन इंक्रीजेस ब्लड कैल्शियम लेवल्स बट कैलसीटोनिन फ्रॉम द पैराफॉलिकुलर सेल्स ऑफ थायराइड ग्लैंड डिक्रीजेस द ब्लड कैल्शियम लेवल्स ओके वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक विच नीड्स बी नो नाउ आफ्टर दिस आई वॉन्ट यू टू अंडरस्टैंड वन इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट ओके गाइस द अल्टीमेट एक्टिवेशन एक्टिवेशन ऑफ विटामिन डी इज हैपनिंग वेयर Activation of vitamin D is happening in the PCT cells, no doubt. With the help of which enzyme? The enzyme which is helping in the activation of vitamin D is alpha one hydroxylase. My question is, this alpha one hydroxylase activity will be controlled with the help of a hormone, which means there is one hormone which will activate the function of alpha one hydroxylase. Now, what is that hormone? first of all just think logically just think logically for example if alpha 1 hydroxylase is activated means vitamin d will be activated if there is activation of alpha 1 hydroxylase vitamin d is activated now when vitamin d is activated blood calcium levels will be elevated now tell me which hormone increases which hormone want to increase the blood levels of calcium yes parathyroid hormone so remember we all know parathyroid hormone increases the blood calcium levels how how parathyroid hormone have many actions many actions out of which the most important action is parathyroid hormone will activate the alpha 1 hydroxylase when alpha 1 hydroxylase is activated what alpha 1 hydroxylase will do alpha 1 hydroxylase will convert see it will convert inactive vitamin d into active form of vitamin d when the vitamin d is activated it increases the calcium absorption when calcium absorption is increased it increases the blood calcium levels okay so that's how the entire system works so at the end of the day what is the question that will be asked in your exam alpha 1 hydroxylase activity is regulated by alpha 1 hydroxylase activity is regulated by the parathyroid hormone okay keep that one point in mind okay after discussing about the activation of vitamin d let's also discuss about ras pathway renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway let me write it down here guys renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway okay renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway which is also called as ras pathway that is renin angiotensin aldosterone system okay now most of the students first year guys especially they find it very hard to understand this ras pathway which is very very simple remember for your entire life what is the main function of this ras pathway ras pathway function is to increase your bp or the maintenance of the bp i should i shouldn't say increase the bp maintain the bp how ras pathway will maintain your bp or how it will bring back the bp to normal for example if your bp is falling this ras pathway will be activated it increases your blood pressure and how this will happen so let's see one by one first let's start with the bp decrease okay now our first condition to activate this ras pathway First, what we need to do? BP is decreased. Now, when BP is decreased, what will happen? I have said to you, when BP is decreased, the juxtaglomerular cells, okay, the juxtaglomerular cells in the kidney, in the nephrons, okay, in the nephrons, there are certain cells called as juxtaglomerular cells, okay. In the later uh, lectures, I will show you what exactly are these juxtaglomerular cells, what exactly is macular denser. In the upcoming lectures, we will discuss. But as of now, just remember, when BP is decreased, the decrease in BP can be sensed by, okay, can be sensed by a certain type of cells in your nephron called as a juxtaglomerular cells. Now, these juxtaglomerular cells, what they are doing? they will produce renin we have already discussed right renin is produced by the juxtaglomerular cells in the nephron 
Now, what this renin will do? Now, this renin is going to act on something called as angiotensinogen. Okay, angiotensinogen in the name itself. See, angio means blood vessels, tension means constriction. Okay, but don't worry. There is something in your blood called as angiotensinogen. Now, this angiotensinogen, you will get it out. Sir, from where it came into the blood? Angiotensinogen is produced by the liver. Okay, all the time angiotensinogen is produced by the liver and it came into the blood. So, all the time in your blood, there is something called as angiotensinogen, which is inactive. Now, when renin acts on angiotensinogen, this angiotensinogen will be converted into angiotensin 1, angiotensin 1. Now, this angiotensin 1, where it is present? It is present in blood only. Now, this angiotensin 1, it will go to lungs. In the lungs, specifically, what is the specific area? Palmo nari capillaries okay so in the lungs in the pulmonary capillaries there is a very important enzyme present what is that important enzyme present is angiotensin converting enzyme now this angiotensin one it will go to the lungs in the lungs there is enzyme called as angiotensin converting enzyme it converts angiotensin so angiotensin one is going to lungs in the lungs this angiotensin one will be converted into angiotensin 2. So, at the end of the day, what we are left with, sir? We are left with something called as angiotensin 2. Now, first of all, just think logically. What is the problem? Sir, problem is decreased BP. BP of the person is going down. Why BP of the person is going down? Might be because he is having some hemorrhage. Okay. Uh, he is traveling. He is traveling on a motorcycle. He had a road traffic accident. Now, he is having hemorrhage. Okay, now hypovolemia is there from his body, blood is losing. Now he is having hypovolemia, he is losing blood, so also his blood pressure is going down. Okay, blood pressure is going down. When blood pressure is going down, his body need to bring back the blood pressure to normal. So that's what our problem is. See, BP is going down. So what his body should do, what his kidney should do? Kidneys also helps in maintenance of BP via RAS pathway. So, at the end of the day, BP should come back to normal. How we can increase the BP? By causing vasoconstriction. So, whenever the blood vessels are constricted, when, when blood vessels are constricted, automatically pressure inside the blood vessels, that is the blood pressure, will be elevated. So, important point is, this angiotensin 2, do you know what it will do? It will cause vasoconstriction. It will cause vasoconstriction. This vasoconstriction increases the BP. So, at the end of the day, we have achieved, okay, we have achieved our target. BP is increased because of vasoconstriction. Angiotensin 2 is a vasoconstrictor. In the name itself, it's there. Angiotensin. It, it increases the tension in the blood vessels. Or we can say it contracts the blood vessels, increases the blood pressure. Okay. Now, apart from that, See, this is direct action. Blood vessel contraction will increase the BP. See, this angiotensin 2, it will go to something called as adrenal glands. We all know on the top of kidneys, there is something called as adrenal gland. Now, you have to tell me, what are the regions in the adrenal gland, guys? There are two important parts in the adrenal gland. One is adrenal cortex and adrenal medulla. Okay, cortex and medulla. Periphery is the cortex and the central most part is the Medulla. Now, we all know from the medulla, what are the hormones which are getting produced? Sir, so from the medulla, the most important hormones that are getting produced is epinephrine or epinephrine. Okay. Epinephrine, norepinephrine or adrenaline, noradrenaline are getting produced. But forget about the medulla. Right now, we are more concerned about the adrenal cortex. Adrenal cortex was divided into how many regions? Three regions. That is G, F, R. So, what are these GFR? So, let me write it down here, guys. G, F, R are the three regions in the adrenal cortex. What are the three regions? Are the, what are the three zones? The three zones are called as zona, glomerulosa. And the second zone is called zona, fasciculata. And the third zone is called as zona, reticularis. Okay. Now, our important point is, 
angiotensin 2 it is coming where it is coming to adrenal glands okay it's coming to the adrenal gland now where it is acting in the adrenal medulla or in the adrenal cortex it's acting on the adrenal cortex sir now in the adrenal cortex there are three regions in these three regions it's acting where now this angiotensin 2 it acts on zona glomerulosa okay it acts on zona glomerulosa so zona glomerulosa is acted upon by angiotensin 2 now what happens this zona glomerulosa is going to produce a hormone called as aldosterone so aldosterone is produced from the zona glomerulosa now let me write it down here guys at the end of the day this angiotensin 2 helps in the production of aldosterone Rhone. Now, what this aldosterone will do at the end of the day? The aldosterone should have to increase the BP. How it will increase the BP, sir? Aldosterone acts on the nephrons, especially on the collecting ducts. It acts on the collecting ducts. What it will do? It increases the sodium reabsorption. It increases the sodium reabsorption. Now, aldosterone which is also called as a mineralocorticoid. Aldosterone is called as a mineralocorticoid. Why it is called as a mineralocorticoid? Because it is associated with the mineral metabolism. Which mineral metabolism? Sodium. So whenever, remember, whenever aldosterone is there in your body, this aldosterone will go to the nephron, it will act on the collecting ducts, helps in the reabsorption of sodium. So more and more sodium is getting reabsorbed under the influence of aldosterone. So what happens if more and more sodium is reabsorbed? You are keeping more and more salt into your blood. So, we all know, even our grandmothers know, that if sodium concentration is increased in the body, it increases the BP. Yes. So, when sodium reabsorption increases means, it again increases the BP. Okay. Sodium attracts the water from the surrounding. Okay. In your blood, if sodium levels are more means, it will bring the water okay uh, sodium attracts the water wherever there is sodium water follows the sodium right so whenever sodium concentration increases in your blood it will uh, it will attract the water from the tissues so blood volume increases automatically blood pressure increases so at the end of the day what i am saying is when ras pathway is activated with the help of angiotensin 2 blood vessels will be undergoing vasoconstriction increases the BP. Also, this angiotensin 2 acts on the adrenal gland, helps in production of aldosterone. Now, this aldosterone increases the sodium reabsorption. Now, whenever the sodium reabsorption happens, that also increases the BP. So, these are the two important uh, okay, uh, uh, cycles which you need to know. One is vitamin D activation and second one is RAS pathway. Okay, guys, if you have any doubts, please ask me. Like, you know, I am just uh, uh, seeing your comments. If you have any doubts, you can all the time ask me. Okay, before that, see, I have discussed a very important point with you. That is vitamin D activation. Okay, vitamin D activation and aldosterone. So, I want you to know two important points. One is vitamin D activation and second one is aldosterone. See, this vitamin D, it came out of what? Just tell me. Sir, vitamin D is something which have synthesized from the cholesterol, right? The cholesterol in your skin, it changes its form and converted into vitamin D. So, vitamin D precursor is cholesterol. Am I right or not? Yes. Even aldosterone in the name itself, it is there. Sterone. Sterone means steroid hormone. Now, important point I want you to know is, see, for both the vitamin D as well as aldosterone, the precursor molecule is cholesterol, cholesterol. Now, why this is important, sir? Why you need to know this is because, see, any hormone which is made out of cholesterol, see, there are other hormones which are made out of cholesterol, something like um, uh, sex corticoids, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, okay, uh, cortisol, there are other hormones also which are made out of cholesterol. But here, as of now, we just discussed about the vitamin D, aldosterone. Now, their precursor molecule is cholesterol. Now, what is the importance? Any hormone which is made out of cholesterol, they can cross 
दे कैन क्रॉस सेल मेम्ब्रेन सेल मेम्ब्रेन्स ओके दे कैन क्रॉस द सेल मेम्ब्रेन्स सो इफ दे आर क्रॉसिंग द सेल मेम्ब्रेन जस्ट आंसर मी इफ दे कैन क्रॉस द सेल मेम्ब्रेन द रिसेप्टर द रिसेप्टर फॉर विटामिन डी एंड द रिसेप्टर फॉर आल्डोस्ट्रॉन इज प्रेजेंट ऑन द सेल मेम्ब्रेन और इन साइड द सेल ओके इफ आई हैव टू शो यू वन सेल सी दिस इज अ सेल usually what students will think sir the receptor is there on the cell surface okay the receptor is present over here that is called as a cell surface receptor but remember right now we are discussing about uh, just me one minute guys right now we are discussing about those hormones which are made out of cholesterol if they are made out of cholesterol i have said you the steroid hormones vitamin d as well as aldo aldosterone they can cross the cell membrane so the receptors of vitamin d as well as aldosterone is present in the cytoplasm okay very important point i want you to know the receptors of vitamin d and aldosterone are present in the cytoplasm so the, at the end of the day the important point to be noted is steroid hormones cross lipid bilayer okay it crosses the lipid bilayer or cell membrane okay so steroid hormones have intracellular receptors or cell surface receptors so steroid hormones they have intracellular receptors okay very very important point now here guys i just want to uh, utilize this situation okay, i just want to take advantage of this situation even though this is not a topic of renal physiology but i want you to know a few important points about the receptors see intracellular receptor if i am talking about intracellular receptor the intracellular receptors can be of two types okay what are the two types of intracellular receptors inside the cell the receptor can be in the cytoplasm cyto plasm that is intra cytoplasmic receptor okay or even the receptor can be present on the nucleus or inside the nucleus that is intra nuclear receptors so intracellular receptors can be of two types what are they intra cytoplasmic or even intra nuclear i have already taught you that aldosterone okay and vitamin d aldosterone and vitamin d they are having intra cytoplasmic receptor can you name me if you if you know can you name me certain other hormones which are having receptor in the cytoplasm in the cytoplasm the receptor is there in the cytoplasm not on the cell surface can you name me any hormones which are having receptor on the cytoplasm See, aldosterone is an example of mineralocorticoid. Okay. Now, the second hormone which is having intracytoplasmic receptor is cortisol. Okay, cortisol, which is an example of glucocorticoid. Glucocorticoid. Gluco means see, mineralocorticoid. Why we are saying it as a mineralocorticoid because it is associated with the mineral metabolism. Which mineral metabolism? Aldosterone helps in the absorption of sodium. now cortisol is an example of glucocorticoid gluco means it helps in glucose metabolism okay and the third important hormone which is having intracytoplasmic receptors is testosterone okay so testosterone the uh, sex hormones are also having the sex hormone is also having intracytoplasmic receptor so aldosterone cortisol testosterone and vitamin d they are having intracytoplasmic receptors and can you name me what are the hormones which are using intranuclear receptors if you are really good just name me there are actually four important substances for which the receptor is present in the nucleus can you name me those hormones just remember i have a mnemonic for myself the mnemonic is sex with t3 and t4 sex with t3 t4 okay now what does i mean by sex with t3 t3 t4 here sex refers to sex 
हार्मोन्स लाइक ईस्ट्रोजन प्रोजेस्टिरोन ओके सो ईस्ट्रोजन एंड प्रोजेस्टिरोन आर हैविंग विच रिसेप्टर्स आर हैविंग इंट्रा न्यूक्लियर रिसेप्टर्स एंड विट दिस विथ फॉर विटामिन ए yes vitamin a is also having intra nuclear receptors and what is this t3 and t4 so t3 and t4 are having which receptors they are having intra nuclear receptors the t3 and t4 are the thyroid hormones okay uh, t3 means triiodothyronine and t4 means thyroxine so they are having intra nuclear receptors sex with t3 t4 so i just want you to know so even though it's not a topic of renal physiology just i want you to know okay very important for your exam purpose okay now guys do you have any other questions Yeah, that's a, that's what the mnemonic. Okay, sex with T three D four. It's just a mnemonic so that you can easily remember. Okay. Guys, shall we go forward? Now, see one important MCQ for your exam purpose exams. In the RAS pathways, they will ask you, what is the stimulus for the activation of RAS? The kind of question that will be coming in your exam is, all of the following will activate the RAS pathway except, all of the following will activate the RAS pathway except. Now just tell me, see in the pathway itself I have clearly shown you, what is the first stimulus for the activation of RAS? See the entire RAS pathway started with decrease in BP. So, very very important point is, take down here, the first stimulus for the activation of RAS pathway is decrease BP. Okay, so hypotension, hypotension is a stimulus for the RAS pathway activation. Second question, is there is any other stimulus for activation of RAS? Guys, remember, normally RAS pathway increases the BP or not, yes. RAS pathway increases the BP. RAS pathway increases the BP by sodium reabsorption or not? Yes, sodium reabsorption. So, when RAS pathway is activated, sodium reabsorption is increasing. Now, just tell me, if there is hyponatremia, the blood levels of sodium is falling down. Now, in those conditions also, RAS pathway will be activated or not? Why? Because one of the function of RAS pathway is to increase the sodium reabsorption. So, if there is hyponatremia in your body, then also it will stimulate the RAS pathway. Okay. So, very important point is the second stimulus for the RAS pathway activation is hyponatremia. Okay. Second. Now, third. There is one more stimulus for the activation of RAS pathway. What is that? Okay. Let me write it down here. First stimulus is hypo tension second stimulus is hyponatremia natremia hyponatremia means decrease sodium levels in your body whenever decrease sodium levels in your body is there that will activate the ras whenever the bp is going down that will activate the ras now third important point is see sympathetic sympathetic activation okay now i am asking you one question guys when sympathetic activity is there in your body, if I ask you, when sympathetic activity is there in your body, will it increase the BP or decrease the BP? Sir, in a fight or flight situation, okay, when a dog is behind you or um, uh, whenever you got caught by your girlfriend in a, not, uh, in a naughty situation, okay, now what happens in your body, sympathetic activation is going to be there. Now, when sympathetic activation is there, it increases the BP or not? Yes, sir, it increases the BP. How? How means? See, when sympathetic activation is there, sympathetic neurons, they will produce what? Sympathetic neurons, they will produce nor adrenaline. Okay, adrenaline, nor adrenaline. Now, this, do you know, this nor adrenaline, it will come to kidneys. Okay, it will come to nephrons. Now, we know in the nephrons, there is something called as juxtaglomerular cells, right? The juxtaglomerular cells. 
Now remember for your entire life, on the surface of this juxtaglomerular cells, okay, on the surface of this juxtaglomerular cells, there are certain receptors, sir. Okay, let me show you with a different color. Now, on the surface of this juxtaglomerular cells, there are receptors called as beta 1 receptors. Okay, beta 1 receptors. Now, this norepinephrine or noradrenaline, it will come and it will bind to this beta 1 receptor. Now, whenever this beta 1 receptor is activated, then also, then also, this juxtaglomerular cells produce renin. Now, you all know when renin is there, automatically it increases the BP. So, now tell me, what are the three important stimulus? The three important stimulus for the RAS pathway activation, one is hyponatremia, one is second, uh, that is hy uh, hypotension, hyponatremia, as well as sympathetic activation. Now, question is, what are the sympathetic receptors? Sympathetic system is also called as adrenergic system. So, I can say something like this. What are the adrenergic receptors which are present on the juxtaglomerular cells? The sympathetic receptors or the adrenergic receptors which are present on the juxtaglomerular cells are beta 1 receptors. Now, second type of question that they can ask you. Activation of beta 1 receptors will cause hypotension or hypertension. Activation of beta 1 receptors will increase the BP hypertension. Okay. Now, I just want to integrate with a little bit pharma. Okay, little bit pharma integration. So, beta 1 receptors are the sympathetic receptors. Beta 1 receptors are present on the juxtaglomerular cells. Okay. Now, these beta 1 receptors are present any other site. These beta 1 receptors, are they present in any other site, sir? Can you tell me? The beta 1 receptors, are they present on any other site? Beta 1 receptors. I want you to answer. Yes. Where exactly the beta 1 receptors are present? Heart. Excellent. Beta 1 receptors are present on heart also. Okay. So, so activation of beta 1 will cause what? Tachycardia. Okay. Tachycardia. Beta 1 activation increases the renin levels. Beta 1 activation will also cause heart to beat more times. That is the tachycardia. Okay, guys. Okay. Now, one important point here I want you to know is, see, imagine if there is overactivation of ROS or imagine, let's say something like this, and the person who is having hypertension and the person who is having hypertension, now I came to your clinic, you are all very good doctors, I came to you, you have checked my uh, vitals, you have also checked my BP, blood pressure, now my blood pressure is somewhere around 150 by 90 or 160 by 90. So definitely I am suffering with hypertension, right? I am suffering with hypertension. Now, you know only one concept, only one concept you know about RAS pathway. So, by understanding RAS pathway, you can treat my hypertension. How? Just tell me. Sir, whenever there is renin, this renin will increase the BP. Whenever there is renin in the blood, that renin will increase the BP. If you can inhibit the renin synthesis or if you can inhibit the renin, okay, if you can knock down the renin in, the, in my body, okay, all the time, some amount of renin will be there in my body, all the time. So, if you completely inhibit the renin, what happened to blood pressure? Blood pressure will come down. You can treat my hypertension, okay. So, hypertension can be treated by many ways. One of a way to, one, one such way to decrease the hypertension or to control the hypertension is by using drugs like renin inhibitors. So, write down here, renin inhibitor. So, what are the renin inhibitors which you know, I am just asking you, just tell me. Can you name me any such drug which will inhibit the renin? Renin inhibitors. Guys, can you name me? Excellent, aliskerin, not tell me sartan. Tell me sartan is absolutely, it's an ACE inhibitor. Okay, tell me sartan is absolutely different. Aliskerin. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Osama, it's a aliskerin. Aliskerin is the renin inhibitor. Now, after this, let's see a few more important points in the renal physiology. That's the basic points. Now, you should answer renal circuit. Let's first discuss about the renal. 
blood flow, renal blood flow. Now tell me, who is bringing the blood to the kidneys? Who is bringing the blood to the kidneys? Very difficult question, right? Oh, it's a simple question. It's the renal arteries. So, renal artery is the one which brings the uh, blood to the kidneys. Everyone knows. But important question that will come in your exam is, renal arteries are a branch of. Renal arteries, they are coming from what? Renal arteries, they are a direct branch of aorta. For example, see, this is aorta. Renal arteries are directly coming from the aorta. Okay. So, branch of abdominal aorta. Okay. Now, second important question that will come from your anatomy is that, see, at what level this renal arteries are coming out? At what level? At which vertebra level? At the level of L1 vertebra. Renal arteries are coming out of abdominal aorta at the level of L1 vertebra. Okay, at the level of L1 vertebra. Now, in a previous exam, in a one of the previous uh, exam, competitive exam, this was asked. Renal arteries are a branch of abdominal aorta. What is the other artery which are also a direct branch of abdominal aorta? Direct branch. Okay, they are almost at the same level, L1, L2 level. There are one more arteries which are also directly coming out of abdominal aorta, which are very important arteries, especially for your reproductive purposes. What is that? Yes, it's a testicular artery as well as ovarian artery. Okay, even testicular artery and ovarian arteries are also a direct branches of abdominal aorta. Okay, gonadal arteries. Gonadal arteries are nothing but testicular artery, ovarian artery. Okay, gonadal, gonadal means, gonads means testis and ovaries, right? Okay, now after this, let me ask you a few questions. What is the renal blood flow? My heart is pumping, my heart is pumping almost 5 liters every minute. Every minute my cardiac output is 5 liters. Out of this 5 liters, how much ml of blood is going to both the kidneys, both the kidneys. How many ml? It is 1.2 liters. Okay, 1.2 liters that is almost 20% of cardiac output. Okay, 20% of my cardiac output is going to the kidneys for the process of filtration. Filtration and excreting the waste products. Okay, every minute both the kidneys are receiving 1.2 liters. Okay, now Second question is, what is the renal plasma flow? Blood flow means entire blood, means blood along with the cells. Okay, see guys, if I have to show you 1.2 liters here, it includes blood cells, RBC, WBC, platelets, okay, everything along with the plasma. Okay, now, here I am just taking out all the cells. If I take out all the cells, what is left behind is plasma. So, we are mainly concerned with the plasma why? because RBC, WBC platelets, anyway, they are not going to be filtered. They are not going to be filtered, they are not going to be excreted. They are cells. What we are concerned is the fluid. That's the plasma component, water component. So, what is the renal plasma flow? The renal plasma flow is 625 ml per minute. Yes, even though 1.2 liters is going to the kidneys, if you take out all the RBC, WBC plasma, if you take them out, what is left behind is only plasma. Okay. Now, how much amount of plasma is going? 625 ml of plasma is going to the both the kidneys for the process of filtration. Why? Because this plasma will be only filtered. Okay. Plasma is the one thing which is filtered, not the RBC, WBC platelets. Okay. Now, 625 ml is going. My question is, out of this 625 ml, how much is actually filtered? All 625 ml is filtered? Definitely not. Out of the 625 ml, only a certain proportion will be filtered. How much is filtered is nothing but the glomerular filtration rate. So, glomerular filtration rate is how much? It is 125 ml. So that from here we can clearly say, sir, to both the kidneys, 625 ml is going, 625 ml of plasma is going. But out of the 625 ml, what is filtered is 125 ml is filtered by both the kidneys every minute. Based on this, we can have a formula called as filtration fraction. Okay, filtration fraction means how much fraction is actually getting filtered. For that, you should know how much is going. Sir, 625 ml is going. 
in that 625 ml how much is filtered 125 ml so how much is this so 20 20 percent so out of 625 ml only 125 ml is filtered that is 20 percent okay so normal filtration fraction is how much in you and me in a healthy individual what is the filtration fraction the filtration fraction is 20 percent sir out of 625 ml of plasma even only 125 ml is filtered okay now here i want you to know two important mcqs just for now as we are discussing about the basics i just want you to know two important direct single liner kind of questions for your exams sir here i have taught you real plasma flow is how much Renal plasma flow is 625 ml, just like that we have said. And glomerular filtration rate is how much? 125 ml. Sir, how can we know? How can we calculate? Okay. See, by injecting certain substances, we can estimate the renal plasma flow. So, renal plasma flow is estimated with the help of which substance? By injecting certain substances into the blood, and by taking the sample of that substances in the urine, you can calculate. All that calculations we will discuss in the upcoming lectures. But as of now, the direct single liner kind of question is, renal plasma flow is estimated by, okay, it's estimated by using which substance? And GFR is estimated by, now can you tell me, someone is saying inulin, yeah, medicals you are saying inulin, yes, you are absolutely true, inulin. Inulin is a marker of GFR. Not only inulin, creatinine. Okay, creatinine. Even creatinine is used as a marker of GFR. And there is one new marker called as cystatin. Okay, cystatin C. Even cystatin C is also a marker of GFR. So, what are the markers of GFR? How can you calculate the GFR? GFR is calculated by inulin creatinine or cystatin C. How we will calculate? What are the formulas for calculation? Other videos. But now, GFR is calculated by these three substances. And also remember, the uh, renal plasma flow, renal plasma flow is estimated with the help of a substance called as PAH. The full form is para-amino. Okay. Hippuric acid. Okay. Para amino hippuric acid is used to estimate the renal plasma flow. Okay. Now, after this, let's talk about few basic points about the nephrons. So, what exactly are these nephrons? Nephrons are the functional units. Okay, functional units in kidneys. Why? Because actually these are the ones who actually do the filtration process. Okay, we all know nephrons and their parts also. Okay, there is a Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, descending limb of loop of Henle. In the upcoming slides, we will discuss that also. But I want you to know two important points here, guys. How many types of nephrons are there? There are two types of nephrons are there. Can you name me what are the two types of nephrons? If you are really good, just tell me how many types of nephrons are there. There are two types of nephrons. What are the names of two types of nephrons? The first type of nephron is called as Cortical nephrons. Okay, don't worry. I will show you what exactly are these. There are nephrons called as cortical nephrons and juxta juxta medullary nephrons. Okay, so cortical nephrons are there, juxta medullary nephrons are there. First, you need to know what is the difference between the cortical nephron and juxta medullary nephron. Guys, right now, please concentrate here. I am showing you one renal pyramid. Okay, one renal pyramid. Now, you will get it out. Sir, what are these renal pyramids? If you see the cross section of kidney, okay, let me show you the cross section of kidney. Okay, kidney, if you done the cross section, it will be something like this. So, here you will be having this renal pyramids. Okay. Now, I am showing you one such renal pyramid. Now, here the renal pyramids are divided into two parts. We all know even in the kidney, the outer part is called as a cortex. And when you go deep into the kidney, that is called as a medulla. So, here... I am showing you one nephron, guys. 
from here be very attentive i am showing you one nephron okay this one nephron it's there in the cortex or it's there in the medulla see here is the cortex this is the medulla now i am showing you the first type of nephron which is mainly present in the cortex so these type of nephrons are called as the cortical nephrons now there is a second type of nephron which is present just near to medulla and the nephron the loop of henle is going deep into the medulla okay its loop of henle is going deep into the medulla so this type of second type of nephrons are called as juxta medullary nephrons okay juxta medullary nephrons why we are calling as juxta medullary nephrons juxta juxta means side okay just side so side to the medulla okay so these nephrons are present in the cortico medullary junction right so they are present just side to the medulla that the bowman's capsule is present just side to the medulla so we are calling it as juxta medullary nephrons so there are two types of nephrons the classification cortical nephrons and juxta medullary nephrons is depends on whether the nephron is present in the cortex or whether the nephron is present in the uh, present near to the medulla now out of this maximum type of nephrons are cortical nephrons or juxta medullary nephrons you just this was a question once asked in an exam majority of nephrons are cortical nephrons almost 80% of the nephrons are the cortical nephrons but juxta medullary nephrons are constituting only to 15 to 20% okay 15 to 20% here let's take round figure 20% okay so 20% of the nephrons are juxta medullary nephrons now why do we have two different types of nephrons okay why do we have two different types of nephrons see the cortical nephrons are mainly 80% of the nephrons they are mainly helps in production of urine okay and under a normal circumstances in a normal circumstances everyday day to day life now urine production is mainly because of this cortical nephrons but the juxta medullary nephrons are there right with the loop of henle going deep down into the medulla they are mainly helping in concentration of urine okay concentration of urine so concentration of direct question concentration of urine is mainly done by cortical nephrons or juxta medullary nephrons juxta medullary nephrons okay as the loop of henle is going deep down into the medulla right now why it is going deep down into the medulla in the medulla there is hyper osmolarity is there it helps in more and more reabsorption of water so juxta medullary nephrons are mainly that we will discuss in detail we will discuss later but as of now juxta medullary nephrons are helping in concentrated urine formation sir is there is any other difference between cortical nephrons and juxta medullary nephrons yes there is one more difference let me show you here here i am showing you one nephron which is a cortical nephron let's take it a cortical nephron okay and this cortical nephron is surrounded by blood vessels or not yes this cortical nephrons are surrounded by blood vessels now these blood vessels which are surrounding the cortical nephrons are called as peri tubular capillaries okay peri tubular capillaries but if i show you a juxta medullary nephron okay here i am showing you juxta medullary nephron okay let's take them as a very simple image now this is a juxta medullary nephron now even this juxta medullary nephrons are also surrounded by the blood vessels okay i am showing you these blood vessels in a different way these are the blood vessels which are surrounding the juxta medullary nephrons now these blood vessels should not be called as peritubular capillaries these blood vessels can anyone tell me what is the name of these blood vessels which are surrounding the juxta medullary nephrons can anyone name me these blood vessels what is the name of these blood vessels these blood vessels are called as vasa recta okay so what exactly is vasa recta now you know vasa recta are nothing but the blood vessels which are surrounding the juxta medullary nephrons the blood vessels which are surrounding the cortical nephrons are called as peritubular capillaries guys have we ever uh, studied about peritubular capillaries anywhere in this lecture have we ever discussed about the peritubular capillaries peritubular in the beginning beginning peritubular capillaries are the ones which produce erythropoietin helps in the production of rbc yes there we have discussed okay now <clears throat> my question is 
Now, in one of the exam, this question was asked. The loop of Henle is the short for which nephrons? Cortical nephrons or juxtamedular nephrons? The loop of Henle is the short for cortical nephrons. The loop of Henle is very long and going deep down into the middle of our juxtamedular nephrons. Okay, know that one point? Now, after this, let's simply write here what is the function of nephron? function of nephron is filtration okay filtration what is the normal filtration the filtration is nothing but glomerular filtration rate 125 ml per minute see if your kidneys are filtering 125 ml of plasma per minute means per minute they are filtering 125 ml so if you calculate calculate it on a daily basis okay 24 hours okay into 24 hours okay per minute there are uh, sorry per hour there are 60 minutes so if you calculate it it will come around 180 liters per day so what i am saying is your kidneys are having a capability to filter almost 180 liters of plasma every day okay so they are all the time filtering 180 liters of plasma Okay, don't think there is 180 liters of plasma in your body. The same plasma is again and again, again and again getting filtered. So, see how good the kidneys are working. So, 180 liters of plasma is getting filtered every day. So, kidneys are removing the uh, bad substances from your body. Guys, do you have any doubts so far? The lecture was going on since 6.30. Okay, the lecture was going on since 6.30. I am just reading your comments. Do you have any doubts? If you have any doubts, you can all the time ask me. No doubts. So let's continue. Let's continue for the next 15 minutes and let's end the session. Like, you know, this, this topic which I am discussing is very, very important point which you need to know. Okay, the last topic that's the filtration barrier. Filtration. Filtration barrier. Now, what exactly is this filtration barrier and why you should know? So, right now, I'm going to discuss about one single nephron. See, nephron is receiving the blood or not? Yes, nephron is receiving the blood. The artery or the arteriole which is bringing the blood to the nephron is called as afferent arteriole. Please know here, afferent arteriole is the one which brings the blood to the nephron and the blood is carried away by the efferent arteriole. Certain amount of blood is coming. Here, filtration will happen in the Bowman's capsule here. Filtration will happen. I will, I will tell you how filtration will happen. But blood is coming to the nephron, to the Bowman's capsule. There filtration will happen and the remaining blood will leave. Now, for the filtration, blood have to, or I should say plasma. Plasma have to filtered from the blood vessel and that plasma should have to go into the Bowman's capsule. How this will happen, sir? See, there are certain barriers. Okay, there are certain things which are present in between the Bowman's capsule as well as the blood vessel. What are they? See here, I am showing you one blood vessel. Okay, one such blood vessel here is the blood vessel. Okay. Now, see guys, the one which brings the blood is the afferent arteriole. This afferent arteriole, whenever it enters into the Bowman's capsule, it divides into many, many capillaries. See, it is dividing into many, many small, small capillaries. These capillaries are called as glomerular capillaries. So, right now I am showing you this blood vessel which is glomerular capillary. So, here will be your plasma. Okay, here will be the plasma. So, please... Take it down here. The plasma is present over here. So, RBC, WBC, plasma, everything are present in this area. Okay. Now, now this plasma with the waste products, it needs to come out. It needs to come out from the blood vessel into the Bowman's capsule. 
for that see there are certain barriers there are certain structures which are present in between now these structures together are called as filtration barriers now what are they the first structure here you see what is this this is nothing but blood vessel so the blood vessel this endothelial cells the endothelial cells of the blood vessel are the first layer so glomerular filtration barrier it consists of capillary endothelium capillary endothelium so what is the second layer sir now are you able to appreciate this brown color layer which is present that's nothing but basement membrane the glomerular capillaries uh, the endothelial cells are present on the basement membrane so this mem basement membrane is called as glomerular okay glomerular basement membrane now after this glomerular basement membrane guys are you able to appreciate these cells okay the cells which are in cone shape now these cone shaped cells are called as podocytes podocytes so the three structures which are present in the glomerular filtration barrier are the capillary endothelial cells glomerular basement membrane as well as the podocytes now please see here guys here is the capillary lumen okay this is the cap imagine this is the blood vessel capillary okay capillary now in the capillary lumen who are they in the capillary lumen there is our wbc is there rbc is there plasma is there now here is the bowman space here is the bowman space okay just like this here is the bowman space okay here is the bowman space now this plasma need to be filtered down this plasma needs to come down like this so what are the structures which are present in this image it, you can clearly see what the structures are the first structure is this endothelial layer the endothelial layer is there now this is the first layer second layer this green color layer is the glomerular basement membrane now down to glomerular basement membrane are you able to appreciate this cone shaped cells this cone shaped cells are nothing but the podocytes so now tell me what are the three layers which are present the three layers are capillary basement uh, uh, the glomerular uh, endothelial uh, uh, endothelial capillary cells basement membrane and podocytes okay now these three forms the filtration barrier okay now the last important point is he guys are you able to appreciate here i am showing you in a in a very clear way guys are you able to appreciate these cells what are these cells guys which i am highlighting here in red these cells are nothing but the endothelial cell see this is the glomerular capillary here is the plasma are you able to appreciate this gaps between the endothelial cells the gaps between the endothelial cells why there are gaps yeah only if there is a gap then only fluid will come from the blood vessels into the urinary space okay see filtration have to happen there should be space there should be space so only fluid is going to leak through the spaces right so important point is there are spaces between the endothelial cells now these spaces what is the name of this space these spaces are called as fenestrations now tell me the gaps between the endothelial cells are called as fenestrations okay now are you able to appreciate there are also spaces between this podocyte cells spaces now what are the name of those spaces the name of those spaces are called as slit pores okay, let me write it down here guys so that it will be easy for you here what are the spaces between endothelial cells fenestrations okay fenestrations are gaps between endothelial cells okay endothelial cells now what are the gaps between podocytes gaps between podocytes gaps between podocytes are called as slit pores okay now fluid will move from the glomerular capillary via the fenestrations via the glomerular basement membrane and fluid will fall down via the slit pores into the bowman space 
okay so this is how fluid will fall down into the bowman space because of the spaces guys having discussed this we have discussed important points and the introductory video is completed now in the next upcoming lecture we will inform you in the uh, in the youtube when the next lecture will be there so please follow this series of lectures here we will be completing the entire renal physiology okay hope the video is helpful if you have any doubts you can all the time you can post your doubts in the comment session okay we will i i will answer the your doubts over there and the next video in the next video we will discuss about the regulation of gfr how the gfr will be regulated first of all why the filtration is happening okay what are the pressures involved in filtration and also in the subsequent lectures we will discuss in detail about what happens in the proximal convoluted tubule what happens in the loop of henle distal convoluted tubule collecting ducts and also we'll discuss about aldosterone and uh, anti diuretic hormone action in the subsequent lectures hope the video is helpful thank you yeah macula densa all that we will discuss in the subsequent lectures okay macula densa what that macula densa is doing how macula densa helps in regulation of uh, glomerular filtration rate that we will discuss in the next upcoming video Okay guys, hope the video is helpful. See you in the next video.